Before we get into this week's episode, we have a really exciting announcement to make. Spike's incredible internship program is back. We're on the lookout for an aspiring journalist to join our team for a six month paid full-time placement. You'd be working with us here in the Spiked office, doing everything from helping us put out our articles to helping us produce podcasts like this one. And you don't need any prior experience to apply. What we're looking for is someone who has a spark for journalism, writing or podcasting, and who has a passion for our pro-freedom, pro-human message. Everything else you can learn on the job. I started at Spiked as an intern, so I can highly recommend applying for this. It's an amazing experience and you get to earn while doing something you love. There really is nowhere better to kickstart your career in journalism. To find out more and to apply, go to spike-online.com slash interns. That's spike-online.com slash interns. You have until Sunday the 19th of May to apply. Good luck. Hello and welcome back to the Spike podcast. I'm Lauren Smith, standing in for Fraser this week. And joining me in the studio today is Spike's editor, Tom Slater. Hello. And Spike columnist, Ella Whelan. Hi. On today's episode, we'll be discussing the revelations from the Cass Report, Britain's broken asylum system, and Westminster's honey trap scandal. A whole four years on from when the Cass review was first commissioned, um, we finally have seen the end result of this um, this review. And essentially, at its core, it says a lot of the things that gender critical voices have been saying for some time now. Mm. But Tom, what can we take from this? What does this all mean? I think we can take from it a tremendous vindication of a lot of the arguments and a lot of the points that gender critical campaigns were making for a very long time. Um, there has been this attempt to downplay the impacts of this report, which we'll get into. But across the scale, it's just demonstrated that what was presented as gender affirming care was not only not helping these children. I think that there's a heavy implication now. The question we have to ask is how much was it actually harming them? But all of the kind of the pillars of what we were told was such essential care for these confused young people, puberty blockers, as you say, this report showing, as has already been known, that there is no reliable evidence to suggest that these work in terms of relieving gender distress, gender dysphoria. Um, the evidence base for that is incredibly weak. Um, similarly, same for cross-sex hormones, as you say. I mean, Cass even goes as far as to suggest that cross-sex hormones, clinicians should use extreme caution when prescribing them to um kids who are 16 and over, which they're currently available to. And of course, puberty blockers are already banned in the NHS in most, in the vast, vast majority of cases as a consequence of Cass's investigation. There's even stuff in there on social transitioning. So this, um, the practice of changing names, pronouns, presenting as the opposite sex um, before even taking any drugs or engaging in any treatment. There's even a suggestion that there's no evidence that it helps or hinders and that there's even some suggestions that it might lead a child to be more likely to go down the medical pathway. So that's the, the story that you see again and again. There's no evidence to back up this treatment. Um, what we do know is that it might nudge them further towards this medical pathway. And given the fact that at the end of this medical pathway is oftentimes someone losing sexual function, reproductive function, that's something which amounts to a tremendous medical scandal and one which has a particularly grim aspect to it because as is said in the report, and as has been known for a very long time, the vast, vast majority of these kids, as you say, are same-sex attracted, either gay or bisexual. So what this has amounts to has been the sterilization of hundreds of gender non-conforming, gay, autistic, troubled kids, and that being cheered on by the great and good for years and years, and the people raising concerns about it being demonized and cancelled and censored and so on. So it is a tremendous moment of vindication, the question now is what happens next? Um, because we've all, there's been very, many kind of false dawns, I think, in this discussion where it feels like things are going to go back on track. But the, the, the trouble that we're now confronted with is that it's been very difficult to dislodge this ideology from these institutions because it is an ideology. It's not just a set of kind of clinical protocols which turned out to be a bit shonky. It's the fact that there are people, not just in the health service, but in the media and government, who are really given to this almost ersatz religion at this point. So whilst there has been a very kind of welcome kind of cracking open the debate as a consequence of this report, it's impossible to ignore. Um, the task ahead of us is still pretty tremendous, I think. Yeah, absolutely. What have you made of this, Ella? Yeah, I mean, you take your victories when they come. And I think lots of people breathed a sigh of relief of having that official stamp from, you know, ex former head of the Royal mm. College of Paediatricians, Hilary Cass, you know, squeaky clean record, nobody can touch her. Um, doing this very thorough and actually very even-handed review. I mean, you have to be fair to her. She does make a big point of something which sometimes the gender critical side can maybe miss, which is that, you know, there are a lot of 
confused kids out there who are stuck on waiting lists, who aren't getting seen for whatever reason. And that's not a good thing, you know, and she she's quite open about the failings in the NHS, which is an important part of this. But a bit like Tom said, I mean, outlining the medical inadequacies, which I think most people knew, which is if you stop puberty, it's going to do something weird to your body. Mm. And, um, and, you know, even the fact of, trying to convince a it's you know impossible to get a 14 year old or even a 16 year old to understand what it'd be like to not be able to have kids or to not be able to have an orgasm you know because they're not interested in that because they don't know sexual life how how would they understand it you don't understand it until you do it um so all of that is is sort of it's good to have it as you say in black and white but i think there is also you know a, should be a bit of soul searching outside of the medical profession because the that's it's the medical scandal then there's the social scandal of you know why is it that so many adults have felt unable to say no to children um parents but that's a complicated sort of area but teachers social workers you know a lot of these kids will have come through cams and child mental health services um and one really interesting thing that Cass outlines in the review is um, and it's just really stark to have it written there, is that 15 years ago you had about 50, mm. 50 cases and it was, she said it was a mainly birth registered boy. So boys who want to become girls. And today it's, you know, thousands with 3,000 girls wanting to become boys. And why didn't anyone at any point say in Gids, Tavistock or wherever, hang on a minute, there's something going on here that's not lots of people authentically wanting to change their gender there's something else. And I think it would be wrong for us to come out of the cash review and say this was just a sort of medical scandal or it was just a big mental health scandal. There's lots of people who are saying this is just abuse of autistic kids and things like that. I think also there's we have to address the sort of social contagion element to it, which is that there are a lots of these girls are attention seeking teenagers, and I mean that in the best way. We all were mm. once, and that's teenagers' prerogative to be like that. But what is missing is the adults in the room who came along and said, enough is enough now. You're not going to get to call yourself Sam and you're going to stop this now. Um, you know, and just sort of was sensible. So it's the sort of, it's the common sense um, thing that's missing. And I think that's what's going to be have to be important to keep talking about because social transition isn't going to stop in schools because of the cash review. Um, private clinics can still deliver some of this treatment despite what the cash review has said. There are these regional hubs opening up, giving, you know, which uh, doesn't seem to have much oversight. Certainly there's no CAS in there making sure that the same kind of failures and treatment continue. So, it, it, you know, it's just the start, I suppose. It's a good start. We should celebrate. Everybody who's been arguing about this should buy themselves a big pint. But it's it's certainly not the end. No, definitely. And one of the things that I think has been really interesting is the response, or I suppose lack of response, from so many of the organisations that have been involved in pushing this um, idea that, you know, we need gender affirming care for children. If they don't get it, then you're killing trans kids because they'll... Another suicide. statistic, incidentally, that the report rebuffs yeah, as yeah, exactly. many people would have already known. But so many of these organisations that have pushed that idea haven't really had that much to say about the CAS review. Uh, the response to it has been pretty muted. And you even have people like, for example, the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, saying that, um, you know, it's it's good that the report um, specifically avoided this um, sort of like cultural war aspect yeah. of the the trans issue, um, and the report itself saying you know it doesn't want to get into the toxic debate around yeah. the the trans question. But isn't this also a problem in and of itself? Like referring back to the the trans issue as being mm -hmm. a sort of cultural war problem. Yeah, absolutely. I I found that response repugnant. I think it serves different functions when people say it's a t cultural and it's been really toxic. In some cases, I think this report and that excuse is their way of quietly admitting that they were wrong whilst trying to pretend that there were these two extremes out there who were being really unreasonable. Fine, whatever it needs to get you over the line. But I think more problematic is when people are saying that and dismissing the people who actually brought this to public attention. So because of this toxic debate, we have the CAS review. Because there were individuals beginning with whistleblowers in the Tavistock 20 years ago mm. who were willing to put their heads above the parapet and saying what was going on here is wrong. Um, it's because of those journalists, campaigners, 
politicians in some cases, who were willing to say the unsayable and face really severe personal and career costs for that. It's because of them that we have this report in the first place. So to kind of wave all of that away and just pretend like there are these two extremes and they were screaming at each other and now we've come through the middle, I think is incredibly unseemly and ungrateful in many respects. But also the big problem with it is that it pretends as if both sides look as bad as each other. Um, there, this debate in the main was one side which had the ear and the seal of approval of the National Health Service, of um, both political parties, of the vast tranche of the media, were saying that it's, it's a good idea to subject confused youngsters to life changing treatments um, off the basis of terrible evidence that was pushed by basically activist organizations posing as professional bodies. Um, the, that it was the people, these people were also saying that you can get rid of women's rights, you can get rid of women's spaces, all these kinds of things. And then the ones who turn up and say, hang on a minute here, they're the ones who are being really toxic and have turned this into a culture war. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. And I think hopefully what we're going to start to see now is those gender critical voices getting more of a hearing in the mainstream because whilst I think the alternative media places like spikes people setting up their own platforms has been tremendously important to bring in this story to where it is now I mean many of us were covering this story before the BBC or anyone else would touch it at the same time unfortunately for the kind of mainstream institutions to change you're going to require that kind of mainstream media debate that's the only thing they pay attention to so I'm hoping that that will begin to shift and it was interesting just on the morning that the report came out voices who you'd seen basically blackballed from those kinds of arenas suddenly getting uh, hearing and not just because they've been booked so they can be hissed at by someone mm -hmm. so yes the, the allegations of it being toxic and being a cultural and whatever I think is um, I get why they're doing it but um, they should stop because it's being as I say tremendously ungrateful to a group of people who have helped unearth a not just a significant medical scandal, but as Ella was saying, a tremendous moral failing on the part of society. A lot of the conversation has also sort of evolved around, will this actually shift the tide against this sort of medicalizing of children? Um, or has it, is it the case that this rot, so to speak, has sort of run too deep now? Well, it's sort of a bit of both. I, th I don't want to undermine the importance of the cat review. I think it is, you know, I think it can be very useful in terms of just having that, professional, expert, well-respected input into this debate. But for all the young people who, thousands of young people who are still looking for these kind of um, treatments and pushing these kind of, um, pushing their parents, pushing, you know, as teenagers do, um, their therapists and stuff to put them on these kind of pathways, there is still mermaid, stonewall, there is still the, the kind of general consensus that um, whether or not you actually get the pills that you are right to think you are in the wrong body, that, th that this is an okay view to have. Um, and so I kind of want us to get harsher. Yeah, I want us to get harsher with kids or more tough love and, and actually be able to have the confidence to set the boundaries that need to be set in this discussion. You know, there will always be cases where someone genuinely is uh, wanting to live a different identity and there are you know I'm not doubting the cases of people who've grown up to be uh, trans and are now 35 and living very happy lives that's absolutely fine but the vast majority of people aren't like that this isn't something that is uh, that is as you know akin to having same-sex attraction or something like that it's a very severe thing an extreme thing what feeling that you hate your own body I think we just need to get better at more confident as um, adults are being able to say to a bit like eating disorders or self harm. This is this is a this is a hmm. terrible thing that you're saying right now. That you want to um, change bits of yourself, not just cut your hair, yeah. but cut bits. But it of has yourself it's been off. the opposite as well because it was a lot of the at the supposed adults who have been pushing this stuff. Hmm. I mean, that's one thing that the cast report touched on, which many people have been aware of, is the phenomenon of kind of influencers on social media, even going as far as you know, giving instructions as to how to respond in a interview or in a discussion with your clinician yeah. in order to go and to get the puberty blockers or the cross sex hormones that you desire. But there's also these institutions in general, because I think I'm sure a lot of concerned parents showed up at a Tavistock clinic or, sh you know, just wanting to kind of defer to the expertise. The problem is the expertise was completely built on sand. I mean, mm. it seems that, and again, Cass underlines this, that a lot of this comes from WPATH, which has recently been exposed um, for its own dreadful um, lack of evidence for its procedures and much worse. Um, 
was basically just kind of laundering this nonsense throughout various Western health systems. And the only ones that the report says that have got good guidelines are the countries who have reviewed it in light of the whole <laughs> gender mm. controversy. Um, and that's one of the things that's so um, striking is the, the number of supposed adults in the room, quite literally, who were not only just sort of going along with this, but actually actively promoting it. Mm. And that's one thing that I find really quite troubling is the how so many of the people, particularly in the media, it's almost like it was more important to them that they virtue signaled, you know, demonstrate themselves as on the side of this oppressed minority, um, raging and railing against this supposed dreamt up kind of transphobic backlash. That was more important to them than thinking about this for at least 30 seconds to work out whether or not this was a good idea. They would much rather that all of these, you know, were implicitly that all of these confused kids were pushed towards these irreversible life-changing treatments because it burnished their own ego. Like that is so much of so many of the problems that we talk about these days is because people would rather not think about something, mouth the platitudes and allow these things to go on because it makes them feel good about themselves mm. rather than it actually treats the people they're going to care about. Yeah, and you know, you'd want maybe a few more apologies. Mm. They're, they're, uh, Dr. David Bell, who was the original whistleblower mm. at the Tavistock was on Channel 4 News last night and was fabulous. Um, and but challenged the person he was sort of on with who was continued, this other doctor who was continuing to give um, treatment, not quite hormone blockers, but was quite defiant in mm -hmm. saying we will still continue to give treatment. And he just said to him, do you not have any regret? Do you not have yeah, any? Yeah, yeah. If you look at what's happened to all these kids, do you not have any regret? Um, and four years ago for Spiked, I interviewed um, Marcus and Susan mm -hmm. Evans, who was a couple who were, um, Susan was a psychiatrist and um, Marcus was one of the um, sort of head honchos at the Tavistock. And they both left and have been instrumental in Kira Bell's case and talk, speaking out. And they made a really important point, which was that, like Tom says, there was a sort of, um, there was an attitude within GIDS as sort of, um, not just personal egos, but also sort of the idea that the Tavistock would become the gender identity clinic. There was this sort of drive for um, a sense that it would be the best, never mind what was happening to young people. But also they made the point that that was mixed in with the fact that there was such an onslaught of patients, thousands. Imagine, you know, in the space of seven, ten years, you've got thousands of kids coming when only there was sort of a trickle. Um, that there was this sort of drive to prescribe, but also a, a sort of classic NHS wave them through, wave them through attitude to it. Um, and it meant that you had, and they told us in the interview, that you had situations in which kids would be put on medical pathways after two one-hour mm. interviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and the important thing that Cass says is that there is no other, you know, area of healthcare from, you know, ingrown toenails being removed to anything else where you get this kind of unevidenced, yeah. um, you know, uncautious uh, treatment. I mean, you, you can't, you have to go through seven appointments to get anything done in the NHS. It's mad that this was happening at such a rate. So, um, and also the, the conspiracy of silence around it mm. is something which has been there from the very beginning because you talk about Susan Evans who blew the whistle back in 2004. Mm. Yeah. 2004 yeah. at that point, you know, Julie Bindle was right for The Guardian. Graham Linehan was the toast of Islington. J.K. Rowling was like a beloved children's author and the only people who thought she was the devil were like crazy Christians in America. Like, <laughs> it was a long time ago and it took a lot of courage to say it then. But ever since then, the, the pattern in the Tavistock Clinic was to ignore those whistleblowers to try and just you know, pretend like what was going on wasn't a problem. And also the cash review itself makes a point of talking about how her research and the research at the University of York with, had this team that were reviewing all of the evidence um, and all of the data were in her words, thwarted by the adult gender clinics who just refused to give up any information. So that one, one of the scandals going on was like, where is all the follow-up data? But then there's also this question about what, they're not even giving what it is that they claim to have. So. That conspiracy of silence around something is around this um, should have always made people suspicious. But again, the, the the way in which they were these services were just allowed to carry on, even though they were acting in a way which no other area of practice would. That's definitely a huge question for the NHS, and it's 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 impossible to conclude that that's not got something to do with obviously fear. There's a lot of this kind of sense of not wanting to engage with this topic, not wanting to think about it seriously, but also ideology. And I think that's one thing that makes all these problems much more difficult to dislodge is that they are given to whether it's because they just like to virtue signal or they kind of believe the tenets of this sort of ersatz religion, they um, were happy to let it carry on, even though it went against all their supposed like, principles and practices and protocols and everything.
If you're fed up with your nine to five, you might be thinking about starting your own business. Working for yourself can be super rewarding and give you so much freedom, but becoming your own boss is easier said than done. Luckily, there's a solution and it sounds like this. Yes, that's the sound of another sale on Shopify, the revolutionary all-in-one commerce platform that gives you the means to turn your business idea into a reality. Shopify supports millions of aspiring business owners like you all over the world. Whether you're trading in king-size beds or tailored threads, Shopify can streamline how you deliver your products, both in-store and online. Now, I know what you're thinking. How does this actually work? Well, Shopify supports your business with a simple point-of-sale system and an all-in-one digital setup. Plus, Shopify will market your social media spaces like Facebook and TikTok. So no matter where you are or what you're selling, Shopify will help you reach your customers. The best part is that Shopify puts you at the heart of your business. You can customize pretty much everything. So no need to worry about blending in with the competition. Shopify's endless customization tools ensure that your brand image is always in your hands. So what are you waiting for? If you're serious about running your own business, you need to try Shopify. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash spiked, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash spiked to take your business to the next level today. That's shopify.co.uk slash spiked. So it seems that only a few weeks ago we were talking about Abdel Azidi, um, the case of an asylum seeker who committed this horrendous chemical attack on a woman and her daughters. Um, turns out that he was previously convicted of a sexual offence here in the UK. Uh, sorry, two sexual offences mm -hmm. here in the UK. Um, and yet was still allowed to be granted asylum. Uh, and this week it's come out that there has been a similar case of a man who was convicted of a sexual offence back in 2017 involving exposure. Um, and yet again, he was somehow still granted asylum. Um, I think the court said that they, there was too great a risk that he would um, face mob violence if he was returned to his home country in Afghanistan. Um, and yet it seems perfectly okay that he's allowed to remain here even when, as was admitted in the court hearing, that um, he still poses a risk to women here in the UK. So yeah, Tom, what have you what have you made of this? Why does this <laughs> keep happening? It was crazy enough when we found out that there were cases like Abdul Aziz where someone was being granted asylum, allowed to stay, despite having committed sexual offences in this country. The fact that someone has been allowed to stay almost because they have committed sexual offences mm -hmm. in this country is absolutely incredible. The, the circular logic is absolutely deranging. The idea that someone, whilst in the, in the process of fighting their own asylum claim, have committed this act, and because of the fact that their, quote, risky behaviours might subject them to trouble if they were taken back to Afghanistan, is going to strike most people as absolutely ridiculous. Um, I mean, I think part of this also we should understand is the kind of intellectual gymnastics that go on when people are trying to fight these claims. But the fact that these are taken seriously by a judge and that someone is allowed to stay on this basis is absolutely insane. And when you stack it along the cases that we've been talking about previously, when obviously there's Abdul Azedi, that, that's been well documented. Some of the other situations in which people have been granted leave to remain on human rights grounds, including a Sudanese ISIS propagandist, an Albanian crime lord who was allowed to stay on the basis of his right to a family life. It does get to the point where it's like, what do you have to do to get deported in this particular country? And the one thing that's interesting about the Sky News reporting about this, which unveiled this, but also some more details about Azedi recently, which we've talked about, is it also talks about the broader dysfunction in the system. So about half of appeals seem to be eventually granted, or at least half of asylum seekers have managed to overturn their refusal to stay. And that also, when even when it's been decided that they should be removed, and only in two thirds of cases, that just doesn't really take place. Um, now, I think it's important to say that um, the idea, and Luke Gittos made this point in this podcast last week, that it's just this wonderful kind of open door system and that people are all kind of taking advantage of it. That's not, it's not that simple. It's such a dysfunctional system that even really worthy cases, to use that phrase, awful phrase, um, often still find themselves caught up in it. If you talk to anyone who's been involved in trying to recess all the Afghan refugees who do have a right to come here, who do not have loads of sexual offences on their record, who you know risk life and limb supporting British and Allied forces and so on, um, the the purgatory that they've been trapped in, even when they're here, is tremendous. So it's not like that. But what we seem to have is a system which is allowing people like Abdul Azedi or this individual to stay here, whilst also failing those people. So I think it just shows that the dysfunction is really needs to be tackled precisely if we want a liberal but sane 
asylum system. And it seems that one is becoming a big block to the other. And also I think it's becoming a big block to public support for it because people are starting to wonder, not without cause, if this system is so dysfunctional that it's actually putting British citizens' lives at risk. Um, and in that context, it's very difficult to land an argument for any kind of more generous arrangement as we might want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was in the sort of reports of um, this man who's been granted asylum, there was a story of a woman from Zimbabwe who has been <laughs> appealing for 18 years um, and, you know, has, you know, could have had her asylum, but she was a, a political refugee, um, could have had her case open and closed very quickly and then be living a life as a British citizen with all the benefits mm. and responsibilities that affords and, you know, not having such a a weight hanging over her head of whether or not um, she's going to be deported. But like Tom says, that's, I mean, un unbelievable that that's not sorted and, you know, m mass number of appeals. And at the same time, you then have these cases who seem to be sort of waved through. There's a, you know, it actually, I think, boils down to quite a boring, in some cases, a sort of boring explanation of just deep inadequacy within the processing system, which is that, you know, I don't want to sound like Jacob Rees-Mogg, but you do have this sort of crisis in the civil service of them not actually want, you know, lots of them um, not actually wanting to work, cases, caseloads going missing, um, proper filing not being done. I mean, we know that that's what happened, for example, in relation to the Windrush scandal, and a lot of it is happening in relation to um, Afghans at the moment. Um, but there's also this kind of, I think, sort of politically the problem is that the, the notion of asylum seeker has taken on this great moral weight um, of if you're an asylum seeker, it doesn't matter what you've done, what the context is, you and the word refugee, you are ultimate victim. Um, you know, there was that whole, it's sort of that, that, that sort of overblown narrative of victimhood began in 2017 when you had the mass massive problem of um, Syrian refugees and the death of that little boy Alan Kurdi and all that kind of thing. And I think that's really infected the way in which people who are working in the asylum system approach it, which is that there is this sort of moral blackmail. I mean, how else do you explain allowing a, some, a flasher to come and stay here because him being a flasher is a danger to him. I mean, how else do you explain that other than the, the idea that the sort of victim narrative is being weaponized to such an extent? Um, you know, obviously this more, more broadly in relation to illegal immigration, we see this sort of, you know, return with sort of people who you've got, you know, Albanian economic migrants who are just young men looking to try and get a good job or whatever and a fair play to them but or being, just trying to get over and work in the black market yeah, yeah, sometimes being, the case, being labeled know. as um as you know these uh terrible victimized worthy of sympathy you know and and so it just completely clouds what we need which is a very cool-headed judgment and assessment of who should come in and who shouldn't and as tom says i completely agree at that point you can then start winning over people to the argument that we've Mm -hmm. could and should be and have the facilities to be um open and generous in relation to this but you at the moment it's like you're shadow boxing because no one within the um asylum system no one who none of nobody who has the power to make things happen whether it's judges or politicians seem to want to grapple with this issue which is that we're lying and using the wrong kind of terms for what we're talking about because there is this there is this sort of moral blackmail going on about what's going on with immigration. And that's weird willful naivety as well. I mean, you saw that reflected in the Azedi case and the various kind of reverends who vouched on his behalf and people who pointed out that there was, you know, there's a lot of people on the booby Stockholm convert to Christianity. Do you reckon some of them might be mm. doing it just to stay here? I've got no reason to believe that. I mean, <laughs> maybe you could take that from, you know, a man of faith who desperately hopes that he's saving souls and whatnot. But the fact that the system generally judges um, people working on these cases... A gi a giving them a giving into this idea that these people are almost like all angels by definition mm. is ridiculous. It's also, I mean, it's naive in the sense that like the idea that any of them could just be coming here for the sake of economic migration as if no one would ever think to do that is naive. But it's also, it's kind of dehumanizing at the same mm. time. It's this idea that um, they're not real human beings like the rest of us. There's not going to be ones who are lying. There's not going to be ones that are telling the truth. There's not going to be ones who are here for good reasons and ones who are here for bad reasons. They just become this kind of symbol. And again, it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier where, and part of the reason why so many politicians have said such ridiculous things on this, on some of these cases and some of these particular issues is 
you know, it's, it's almost impossible for them to concede that any of, that there might be something wrong or that some of these people maybe shouldn't be here. Like that's just is something that they're not willing to dare utter because it would just make them look bad. That seems to be the only reason. But the fact that that is happening across the whole scale of the system, this isn't just about politicians, virtue signaling on Newsnight, um, shows how, what again, what a kind of deep and sort of intractable problem that is, I guess. So the other topic that I want to get onto today is about William Ragg, the Conservative MP. Um, well, sorry, former mm. Conservative MP, now independent, um, in Hazel Grove uh, in Greater Manchester. Uh, it came out last week that he had become embroiled in this sort of honey trap, sex scandal type situation. Um, essentially what happened was that he was chatting to some guy on Grindr, the gay dating app, um, and ended up sending some compromising images of himself to this person he was talking with. Um, and that person then used those images as leverage over him, ended up sort of demanding uh, contact details for various other MPs and uh, Westminster staffers and journalists and such. Um, and yeah, the the response to this, I mean, the whole, the whole case has been completely bizarre. Um, obviously it's not a very clever thing to do if you are a public figure to send, you know, naked images of yourself <laughs> to random strangers. Um, but the response to this has also been pretty interesting. Um, you have a lot of people saying, you know, we should feel really sorry for him. Yeah. He's a victim in this case. Um, he's courageous, according to Jeremy Yeah, Hunt. yeah. You have Chancellor Jeremy Hunt saying that he's courageous, um, particularly for apologising and coming is, forward Is it about courage it. to take a picture of your penis and send it to someone you don't know, <laughs> may not even exist. Like, that's a kind of courage, but, you know. Well, <laughs> yeah. On quite. a serious note, uh, in any political organisation, mm. the number one rule is that you do not sell out your comrades. I mean, yeah. you know, I cannot believe that he was not immediately sacked. That there's, you know, if you, if you are, you know, hanging Lee Anderson for saying something, you know, rude and yeah. off colour, if you're, you know... <laughs> The, if you look back at the sort of ways in which MPs have had the the whip removed for, you know, some things that are slight in comparison mm -hmm. to this, compromising the security of your party and security of your political colleagues, I can't believe it. I cannot believe he was not immediately hung, drawn and quartered. Yeah. And I, I suppose why wasn't he? Is it because Rishi Sunak is just desperate to not have any scandal, potentially? Maybe it's a sort of self-preservation thing. Maybe it's because the Tories, I'm not saying that going on grinder, there's a problem with going on grinder, but the sort of level of public degradation that's going, whether it's like tractor porn or, or yeah. there is so much sex stuff going on within the Conservative Party at the moment that you just don't want to know about, or wish wasn't made public. Um, it's, like, it's always the Conservative Party. Get on with your job and stop doing these things. Um, and, and also the fact that lots of people that, a lot of people that he gave the numbers of then themselves. Yeah. Sent pictures. There's at least there's at least two MPs that they know of. I don't think they've been named as at the time that we're recording this. But but is it but so is it just sort of like a don't talk about it non scandal or is it the fact that to come back to the sort of victim narrative idea that he can get away with crying yeah. publicly and saying oh it's so terrible that I was you know I was yeah. under such pressure and you think you're a coward. It's also weird how like people volunteered that excuse almost on his behalf. You know mm. so it was this sort of sense in which he was keeping relatively tight lip, but you just had a lot of people kind of say, you know, he's got a lot of mental health problems and, you know, he's, he's a victim at the end of the day. But I think, uh, you know, there might be all kinds of reasons why Jeremy Hunt felt the need to say that. I don't know what was on Will Rag's phone that might have related or depicted him. It's a bit confusing. But um, there is this reflex, I think, which is the sort of the mental health get out, if that's mm. a horrible thing to say. And I think it's a big problem. Is that how do you hold politicians properly to account in an era in which that excuse is always there? You know, mm. you can do something horrendous, but you can claim that I was going through a really tough time while it happened. But it's obvious that this, first of all, this is stupid. I mean, there was that case, what was it, 10 years ago with that Tory MP, Brooks Newmark, who people might have forgotten about now, it was a ridiculous scandal, where a journalist, Alex Wickham, now of um, Bloomberg, then somewhere else, uh, posed as a 20-year-old Swedish blonde woman and tried to solicit sex pictures from Brooks Newmark, which he instantly took with his face in the picture <laughs> and some quite fetching pajamas. It was like front page news. He was, you know, he was immediately, you know, dispensed with how could you come back from that mm. but now it has because it can be kind of explained away to a certain extent i suppose i mean it, we should say that now at this point he stepped down from 
He was vice chair of the 1922 committees, stepped down. He also had a chairmanship on the select committees. He stepped down from that. He has given back the whip and so on because the, the mood changed and people realised how ridiculous it was. But the fact that even at the beginning of this scandal, there was this ready-made excuse and that it kind of could work, mm -hmm. is it tells you something about the age we live in definitely and it's, it's a bad thing isn't it i mean like i don't you don't have to go down this route that oh it could have been the russians mm. or it could have been you know xi jinping to realize that it's a bad thing if your mps can be that easily blackmailed yeah well it's not a good state of affairs i mean even the, we every week there's news about whether or not they're going to ban tiktok or whether they're going to do all these things because national security threats mm. and you've got politicians mouthing off to whoever will listen in the bar, and you know some of them being potentially Chinese <laughs> spies, you've got other politicians sending blackmailable images of themselves to complete strangers. So you do think, I mean, I'm not that bothered, you know, interested generally by national security. But hang on a minute, I'm not going to be lectured to you about it if you're compromising it yourselves. Because you know, on a serious note, if you are giving out information of MPs, it's just it is a safety issue, you know, there's, there's, I think we should take it relatively seriously, despite the fact that it's from these sort of silly beginnings. But I think the, in, the most interesting thing is to come back to the sort of question of, <laughs> of the sort of mental health victimhood aspect of it, is that, you know, you're supposed to, as a politician, which is meant to be a public service, I don't want to get all worthy about it, but it's meant to mean something. And so I suppose it says something about sort of careerist, politicians these days but it's meant to there's meant to be some kind of honor in it and some kind of self-sacrifice which is that i think particularly in the conservative party at the moment which is obviously imploding that you just time and again see people working for themselves um and you know whether it's going liz trust getting a new memoir out to go on the after dinner circuit or william rag selling out his colleagues there is no sense of sort of a group of people who are committed to an ideology, whether it's conservative or Labour, and are fighting for that and wanting to change the world. It's all always so petty, so personal, and I don't want to care about William Ragg's mental health. I, I shouldn't care about it. It does have no relevance to me. It's not interesting. What is relevant to me is how good a politician he is and what his ideas are. And it feels like the news from Westminster all the time is about personal scandal or personal grievance mm. or who's been bullied, who got hit by a John Burkow's phone, who, you know, all this stuff that we don't care yeah. about because it, all they do is look up their own backsides rather than actually doing something. And I know that's a really depressing thought for upcoming general election, but yeah. it's true. There is a problem though, like Westminster loves talking about itself. Like yeah. <clears throat> when you talk about the politicians or the lobby journalists or whatever, they love a, you know, a scandal like this because it's something that... Um, is that proper kind of Westminster village gossip, which can perpetuate these things beyond that what is necessary. But it does make you think like the quality, I don't, you know, not to fetishize just professionalism in politics, but how dim some of these yeah, people yeah. seem to be is quite alarming. Like the idea that you would just send these bits like, oh, I don't know this number, penis picture. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be <laughs> particularly encouraging. Um, and it's a bit like whenever they have a conversation about anything to do with social media or whatever, it's obviously filtered through their own experience. It's like the number of times that they want, they call for, you know, we need to censor the internet because they don't know how to work out their Twitter settings, <laughs> basically, because they don't know how to block people. They don't know how to keep the nasty stuff away from them. It just shows that um, these people who preside over such vast ways of life now just can't even tie their own shoelaces. Yeah. It's not good. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.